Okay, good morning. We'll get started. We've still got a few people to join, but we'll we'll get started and um, crack on with our day. Anyway, good morning. Um, welcome to our virtual platform to share. Um, I bet you're glad you didn't have to go out in the rain and trudge up to the forum this morning, although I'd quite like to be there and have a bacon roll. That would be nice. Um, so it's been quite a while since the beginning of lockdown. Um, whether or not we have another one is another matter. Um, but we wanted to put this on, we want to be prepared. We want to help you to be prepared for, you know, more working remotely. I can't see that, we can't see that changing uh, anytime soon. Um, and it's something we've been promoting for a while. Um, so we wanted to talk more about Teams and the Microsoft 365 platform uh, and to just share some information with you because um, it's a huge platform and there's new features being released all the time. I can't actually keep up with it, um, but we do try. Um, so over the summer, we've spent uh, a lot of time improving our business processes, refurbishing the office uh, to make it a safe environment for people to come and work here when they need to. Uh, people can also work at home. Um, we've built some apps, which we'll show you in a bit, that will that help us to work remotely and to help us, uh, you know, be in the office and be safe. Um, just thought I'd give you a few team statistics, um, as it was. Uh, a lot of people moving to Teams in January and February time. Obviously, a lot of people moved to Teams in March. So March the 12th, there was 560 Teams meetings per day. By the 16th, it was 900 million. And by March the 31st, it's 2.7 billion Teams meeting per day. I think that um, just shows how much it's grown. Um, just some other usage stats. So in November last year, it was 20 million daily users. March was 44 million users. And by April, there's 75 million uh, daily users of the Teams platform. Um, so I'm not going to talk for too long now because you'll all get bored of that. Uh, so today we've got some speakers from inside our business. We've got Jordan, Jack, and Stuart all going to do a talk, and we've um, Jamie has kindly Jamie from EAAA has kindly volunteered to to do a talk at the end on on his Teams platform. Um, there's a Q and A box. Uh, please ask questions as you go. Oh, there you go. There's our speakers. Uh, please ask questions as we go. If you want to pop in a chat box and say hello, um, pop your hand up. Uh, yeah, just just get involved, be interactive. We'll ask answer questions as we go along. Um, and I'm sure that at the end, Sam will send out a survey as well. So if you could fill that in, um, just give us feedback on how you thought the event went. So first up this morning, um, we've got Stuart, who's going to take us through some new Teams features. Um, so over to you, Stuart. I'll stop sharing and off you go. Good morning, everyone. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Stuart, Techn Technical Director at Breakwater IT. Let me just share my screen and then we'll take you through some new Teams features. Some of these have been out for a while now, but we'll, we'll run through them anyway. So the first one uh, that I want to bring to your attention is Together Mode. This gives uh, a single screen to show everyone in the meeting. So normally you see little tiles of people's cameras. This shows one background and um, one background with almost like seats or behind a desk and shows everyone's camera there or the image of everyone's camera. Sure, we can't see your screen. Well, I can't see your screen, I don't know. Okay. Can you see it now? Yeah. Okay, perfect, thanks. Um, so, yeah, it gives uh, users the Microsoft AI platform to use everyone's camera image um, and then projects that behind a certain background as if you're all in the same room. It does require five participants on the meeting and scales up to 49 um, for together mode. Um, this can be enabled by selecting the three dots similar to the image on the screen um, and then hit, hitting together mode. It's not currently supported with external contacts. Um, below, uh, so as we go through, so this is what it would look like if you had 16 of me on a single call, which obviously isn't that realistic. Um, this is what it would actually look like um, if you had 16 individuals on a call, um, and that's a background, almost like a, uh, a lecture theatre or something like that, but there are various different backgrounds that you can use. Microsoft say this is to make um, video meetings more immersive. So on to the next one. Custom background. Some of you may have already played with this. We certainly have internally. And there's been some quite um, 
comical backgrounds used uh, inter internally. Um, so you can set your own background for the meeting. Uh, Microsoft do provide some inbuilt ones. Um, you can also uh, add your own images in there as well. Um, it's enabled the same way with the three dots and then apply background effects that then lists the inbuilt ones and uh, any of your own as well. Um, this is often used as a, uh, an alternative to blurring your background, uh, which, um, so if you don't want someone to see if you're working from home and you've got things in the background you don't want people to see, it's often used as a, a method to get around that. Um, so there's three examples here as well. So this is me looking happy on a beach. Uh, this is me looking unhappy in a classroom uh, and this is me looking amazed by a suspension bridge. Uh, there is one thing to be aware of which uh, is on the last image is sometimes the camera picks up the background image and you can see part of the suspension bridge is actually going into my neck. So chat enhancements, this is one of my favourite uh, features and the most useful ones because um, historically in Teams if you are working on a document um, and then one of our colleagues sent a chat message and that come through, it would then take you back to the chat screen, which was very annoying. Um, now you can click on that little icon, which is next to the bullet point. That pops the chat out into a separate window, so you can carry on um, with your chat, chatting to your colleagues while um, doing other functions within Teams. Uh, the second one is chat reactions. This is where you can use emojis to uh, express how you feel about uh, a chat comment. So this one, Jax um, said hello to me um, and I've hovered over it and you can see the commonly used emojis. And you can see here, I have loved the uh, chat message. Um, some other meeting enhancements, uh, video spotlight. This is uh, where you can give the sole focus of the screen rather than a tile effect, um, have a full screen image of, for example, the person presenting the meeting. Um, this then applies to all members uh, within the meeting as well. Uh, the second one is uh, raising your hand. Um, I do know of some companies who uh, have a policy on this where if there's large meetings, they have to raise their hand to speak to prevent people talking over one another or ask a question. So that is quite useful, may not apply to everyone, but I have, I'm certainly aware of it being used. So some new features coming soon. Uh, custom layouts, this actually looks quite good if you're doing a lot of presenting because you can superimpose your webcam um, video feed into a presentation in the background um, to make it almost look more professional. Um, and the other one is um, if you've been using Zoom for any length of time, you know that there's options for breakout rooms in there. So you can split one big meeting into lots of smaller meetings. Sometimes this is used for social events as well, or if there's one big meeting and then you split it out for discussion then bring everyone back. Um, the organizer of the meeting can switch between different breakout rooms as well. So moving on. So this is what I'm gonna do a, a demo of uh, shortly, but I'll just run you through um, shifts to begin with. So shifts is an application that Microsoft developed within Teams um, to organize and schedule your team. Um, so you can, it gives you the options for clocking in and out, time off requests, so holiday and sickness, and some of that is customizable as well. Um, Timesheets, timesheet reporting. There's also a mobile capability, um, so there's a mobile app for it to check in um, if you're not using a, a desktop machine uh, day in, day out. A couple of uh, informative bits on shift. So each shift is tied to a team. Um, the team owners are administrators for the shift. Um, only team members can be added to the shift instance. Um, so I would recommend dedicating uh, a team for each shift instance that's required. Um, there's also a caveat with uh, the so you can check in based on um, GPS coordinates, so where you'd expect people to check in. You can only set one set of coordinates. So if you've got multiple sites, it might be worth splitting that into individual shift instance if you're going to use it. So let's hop into a demo. Can you see that screen still? Cool, right, so this is uh, how shifts uh, 
looks. Um, so you've got some dates along the top. Um, you can split that into monthly, weekly views. Uh, the next column down is day notes. So you can see on the 10th uh, of November, John is um, buying us all pizza at lunchtime. <laughs> um, next, uh, you've got the members down on the left hand side, members of the shift. Um, you can split these into groups as well. Um, and then uh, as we work along the rows, there's what shift they're assigned to. And I've created um, several different shifts uh, in this scenario. There's also uh, an option for open shifts, which gives people the ability to request um, an open shift. And then that pops into their, um, into their row. I'll show you that in a second. Um, you can switch views. So you can come up here and just show your own shifts. Um, you can uh, change it to shift. So if you were looking at an, an oversight, you can see how many people are assigned to what shift at what time rather than the actual individuals. So if you wanted to um, assign a shift, you can come up, come into a cell or you can highlight multiple cells um, and then select the uh, magnifying glass and then select test shift, for example. I obviously didn't highlight it either. Um, if you wanted to create a new shift, you can right click in a cell and hit add shift. This brings up a new screen. Um, so by default, it will name the shift by the times selected here. Um, and then obviously that's who it's assigned to and that's if it's an open shift. Um, so we'll leave that there. If we want to rename the shift so it's not displaying the times, you can um, overtype in here. It's a creative name. Um, you can also add notes to the shift and activities. The activities will apply only to this shift. So if you assign this shift to someone else, the activities won't necessarily copy across or they do get an, uh, an option for that. So if I create an activity in there, um, and then you've got the option because you've got whether you want paid or unpaid um, times during the day as well. So then if I save that, That'll then populate in there. Um, going back to the open shifts, I did get Jack prior to the meeting to put a request in. So he's requested uh, one of the weekend overtime shifts. So um, you can select the checkbox and then approve that. And then Teams does its magic. And you can see Jack has now that open shift, the weekend overtime, has moved into uh, Jack's row so he can um, make sure he does that weekend overtime on uh, the 15th. So some other things to go into. So you can also assign, so if someone phones in sick, you can uh, select their shift and add time off. Um, so it's obviously got the assigned user dates and you can select whether it's paid one page, some of this is customizable, and I'll show you that in a second. So you can select sick day and hit save, and it will show Jack as a sick day there. It then moves the shift below that so you know which shift he would have been on, so you can assign that to someone else if required. You can also put through holidays, so you can come up to requests and new requests, and then time off, and then select your dates and then select holiday, put in a note and then send requests. And then the owner of the team can come in, look at the requests and then approve or reject as they see fit. Into some settings. So it's obviously got standard time zones, start of week, which could be important. Um, whether or not you can, uh, to include shift activities when you copy shifts, which I did mention, uh, open shift. So the requests are all customizable. Uh, and then there's a time clock and so for time tracking and the location coordinates, um, which we would expect to um, check in from. In terms of checking in, there's an option for clocking up here. So yes, I want to clock in. And then it starts a running timer. Um, obviously I won't have clocked in for very long. Yeah, I can end my shift there. And then that um, obviously logs me out. Uh, you can export this data and it exports into uh, a CSV um, 
which then obviously you can do some reporting on in the background. So it's nothing too special for Microsoft there, but it does give you some, an element of reporting. Um, we actually use this internally to track um, out of hours rotors, uh, which is good for us. It gives us a fle flexibility to swap individual days rather than whole weeks. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it works well for us in that scenario. Um, individuals can uh, swap shifts. Um, so that was in requests as well. Um, so under new requests, you can swap or offer a shift out. Um, so you can swap shifts without necessarily anyone else um, have it or an approver having to be aware. Um, I think that pretty much covers everything. Um, as you would have seen, there's, there's an element of color coding based on when you create the shift as well, um, which obviously helps identify which shift is what. Uh, if anyone's got any questions, they can pop them in the Q&A. Stuart, how would you access um, shifts? Ah, yeah, good question. Um, so down here, there's the, the three dots, and then I already have it in my task, uh, my app bar. But if you didn't have it in there, it would show in here. You can also search for it um, through the search facility. And if you have more than one sh uh, shifts instance, um, you can use up here, and then you'd see your multiple shifts instances in here as well. Okay, lovely. Any more questions, anyone? All right, okay. Thanks, Stuart. I'll let you unshare your screen. Um, so, I say um a lot, I'm very sorry. I'd like to talk, I'm going to do a little bit now, um, not about security for once. I'd like to talk about a couple of other things uh, in Teams that are kind of out of the box that you can use um, and set up and use quite quickly. Uh, first of all, I'd like to talk about lists. Uh, lists are what we use a lot in the background of Teams um, for just managing data, managing data in Power Apps, and Jordan will cover some more of that in a bit. And I'd like to demonstrate Microsoft Bookings, which is relatively new, but it's actually quite powerful, and we've started using it, and I know some other people have started using it um, in terms of helping to do some um, bookings. So I'm going to start and show you uh, an easy way to create a list and just show you how easy it is that anyone can do it. Um, in the last few weeks while we've been working out how we do this presentation, it turns out that Stuart is really good um, or has a lot of knowledge about lawns. So you might notice that, um, and he knows a lot about lawn care, grass, scarifying, any question you can always ask him so pop them in the box but we're, i'm going to do my demo based on stuart um, owning a lawn company and i'm just going to close that down and yeah and setting up some systems for him to use so i set up a team called stew's lawns and behind every team is a sharepoint site just a mini sharepoint site only related to that team and teams is what is used as the front layer of that so you have the normal posts, you have files. To access the SharePoint team in the background, you can click on open in SharePoint. So if I click this, it will open it up and I can see the files that are available for that general channel um, under Stu's Lawns. Uh, if you click on home, you can see anything else that's been in here. Um, you know, you can have news on this site in the background if you wanted to, it's just the standard SharePoint stuff. But if you wanted to set up a list that you can use within Teams or within this mini SharePoint site, you can go to Site Contents and you can click on New. Oh, you can see the documents in here, by the way. You can click on Documents and then you see each channel would be listed in a folder and you'll be able to see all other documents underneath that. But I'm going to create a new list. I could create a document library here if I wanted to, but I'll create a new list for now. And this is going to be, I'm going to call it Stu's Lawn Tracker. Um, before I go any further, there are already some basic templates that you can use. So if you wanted to request, um, if you wanted to monitor um, employee onboarding, they have templates for this already, just to give you an idea of this list. So you could have um, the work jobs for onboarding someone, a description. Um, you can have color coding on different items, tick boxes complete, date boxes. You can upload uh, relative, re relevant files, uh, photos, CVs, anything like that. I'm not going to use a template for this. I'm going to set it up from scratch. 
Um, and this is going to be, I'm going to create a blank list and then call it Stu's Lawn Tracker. Um, tracking Lawn Care Visits. So Stuart wants to be able to monitor when he goes to see someone's lawn uh, and help them out and do whatever he needs to do. I'm sure he'll jump in at some point and tell me something that he, he would do if he went to see someone's lawn. Um, he wants to track his visits. So we create the list and when you create the list, you have one column, which is title. Uh, so first of all, I'm just going to rename that column so you can click on it and um, go to column settings and rename. And I'm gonna call that client name. So that's gonna be the people he's going to visit. Well, it's only one column, so I want to probably add a few more. Probably add a few more columns. So I'm going to add a phone number. So I'm going to add a single line of text. So I'm just going to say phone number, um, and I'm just going to save that. So that's another column, and I'm going to add another column. So I'm going to add a date field um, for Stuart. So date of visit. Uh, I'm going to make it. I'm going to pop the time on there because he might go at you know different times and at the friendly format so it looks a bit nicer and save. Then I'm going to create another column for um, lawn quality. So I want a choice and under the choice box, I can add if I could type properly um, different choices. So I could call um, really bad. So that's his visit for that, and I can set a color. And I'm going to set uh, for some reason it doesn't give me red and it gives me pink, but it kind of looks red. Um, I'm going to give this one average. I'm going to give that one the yellow there. I'm going to call this one good. I'm sure Stuart has other naming conventions he might use. Um, and so I'm going to click save on that one. And then I'm going to have uh, multiple lines of text. I'm going to call this my notes field. So he can just add some extra notes. Um, about his visit, what he did when he was there. And I'm going to click save on that. And then just maybe a follow up. So uh, when's his next day in visit, uh, next date of the visit will be. So and again, I'm going to pop include time and a friendly format. Um, okay, so I've set up the basis for the basic there for my list. Um, actually, I'm going to add an image folder as well there, an, an image bit on the end. So um, you could take a photo of the lawn on each go. So now if I want to do a visit, I can use this in this SharePoint view here in, in, um, in the web browser. So I could click on new and I could say client name and I could say Jack Fisher. And I could say Jack's number is, I don't know it, but he's visited the lawn today at, Hold on, where's my drop down box? That oh, was right there. He's going to go, is actually at uh, two o'clock this afternoon. But I'll pretend he has already been. It's really bad. Um, not much grass. But I'm going to go back and see him. So it's going to go back and see him in a, in a week. And he's going to go at, he's going to go at nine o'clock then. And he's just going to add an image. And um, you can see the image. I think it's this one. Just let me just double check. This is Jack's lawn. No, no, that's Jack's lawn, isn't it? Um, so I'm just going to add lawn number one to that. And there we go. I've created my first list and I've started using it and I've got an image of Jack's lawn. So that's okay in the web browser, but it's quite awkward to find. To, you can favorite it if you want to do so that or go through the team each time. But what you can do, you can embed the list into Teams. So if I go back into my Teams under uh, Stu's Lawns there, I can create a new tab under the general channel. Um, it will give me a list of options that I can add. And if I go to SharePoint there, it should pop up the list. There we go. If I click on Lists, Stu's Lawn Tracker, I pop that in there so I can be in Teams, I could be on my mobile, I can be on a tablet, I could be on my laptop in Teams and I can just go and there's my list of my visits. You can start to do other views and you can play with it and do other things and export data to a CSV if you want. Um, so that's one way of viewing it. The, 
the other way that you can view it is to create a power app. Um, so I won't talk too much about power apps, but a power app is um, just a way of making it look more like an app rather than um, just in a list format. So if I click on, go back to my SharePoint site and I click on power apps and I can create an app. And from this list, it will automatically create me a power app. Um, Stuart's visit tracker. It checks if it's already used, already taken that name, and then I click on create. Now this does take a, a minute or so to whirl around and do everything. I'm sure Gintas is uh, loving this. Sorry, Gintas. Um, see, it will just do this for a minute. It's probably the quickest app I've ever built. John, while we wait, there's, there's a question. Oh, is there? Sorry, I couldn't yeah. see that. Go for so it. Can, can you create in a tablet version from a list? Um, yes, this. I think this will automatically create a version that will look like that. Um, I might need to get Gintas to uh, say confirm the rest it, of it, yeah. yeah, to confirm it. But you can, I, if it doesn't do it automatically, you can create a mobile-friendly or a tablet version, a tablet-friendly version of the app. It can be done. You just you would need to change some of the format of it. That's about where my knowledge ends on power apps, and that's why Gintas is here. Um, is there any more questions there, Jack? No, that one literally just popped in while we're waiting. So. Okay, this has taken a bit longer than it did yesterday. I was hoping it would be uh, uh, absolutely fine. So, okay, I'm going to pop back to Teams. And I think I did it in this one. So you'll have to ignore all our testing. And I created one the other day. So if I've created that power up, um, oh no, I think I've deleted it. When demos go wrong, hey? Okay, no, nope, there we go, we're getting there. So it's building it in the background. Okay, I might just come back to that in a minute. But once that's built, I'll be able to embed that app into Teams. So I think I'll just move on for a second. I'll just wait for, see if that uh, loads up in the background and I'll come back to that. Um, yeah, so the next thing I'd like to talk about is Microsoft Booking. So Stuart has his Office 365 subscription. He wants to uh, be able to book his time out and, uh, hold on a second. There you go, there's my power app. So you can see the power app is embedded in, is is here. You can see the one that I've already done. Um, it's in build mode at the minute. There's loads of settings and, and things you can do there. But if I go into my back to Stu's lawns and I click on add and I select power apps, which I can't see. There we go, thank you. It should give me the ability to see all the apps that are in, that I've made that are in the team. So it is Stuart's visit tracker. Um, I can save that and that will now pop this app in there. So as you can see, it'll load up. It's quite basic. There's no customization on it. This is literally, this is just Microsoft automatically creating that app for me. This is the visit we did for Jack. I can see there. Uh, it it doesn't automatically do make it look amazing, but you've got the basic information there. Um, it also hasn't put the attachment in. But if you were using this on a mobile or within Teams, you can just go right. I'm um, oh, that's someone's site. I just want to do a quick visit tracker. I'll pop this in here and I'll say Jordan phone number. Probably need to work on the the date format of uh, two thousand and one. Um, pick my date, lawn quality. Again, so there's some customization that probably just needs to be updated in the app. But the, the basic is there that it's quite easy to create a power app from a list with a little bit of a little bit of time spent playing with it. You can create um, a nice app and have everything there, or you can just use the list in the background. So now, if I go back to this list, I'll be able to see my second entry there. John, I guess this also goes back to that question about creating a tablet version. You can use this. On a tablet, can't you? Yes. So you could uh, you could um, open up Teams on your tablet, and you can 
or your phone and you can just load this app in there or you can just load the the list within teams on your on your on your device okay so we've also had one more question john oh okay so luke frost has asked do you need a power apps license for users to use the basic power app um you get power apps with business essentials business standard business premium licenses and e5 license e5 e3 licenses so most people here will already have a license for power apps um within the system somewhere um, there are advanced licensing things if you need to do more complex things uh, and to do with flows and things if you want to start doing more automation in the background yes there are other things that um, you might need to pay for but out of the box you get power apps um, already any more questions jack no that's it for now thanks john okay right so um stuart started his business he wants to be able to take some bookings he wants to be able to give his clients or potential clients the ability to just book a visit and this is where microsoft booking bookings comes in it helps you to schedule appointments and meetings easily and quickly it will integrate with your outlook calendar and it will it really quickly allows people the ability to find a time slot in your diary either for an on-site visit or you can have it automatically create a teams meeting if you want to do some kind of remote meeting i'm not sure how stuart would do that when he's looking at a lawn um so just a quick overview, we've we've started using this uh, for us. I'm just trying to find it in the background here, this one. So we found that we sometimes have a bit of back and forth with people trying to get hold of each other. So we call you, uh, you're not available. You call us back, we're not available. So if we detect that going on, we now send out a link for a remote diagnosis meeting. Uh, the idea is that you can say, okay, well, uh, Friday works for me. I need to talk to William uh, and these are times that William will be free and so you click on there and you, you'll add your details and it will it'll essentially send a Outlook calendar invite to you and to, to William to set up your meeting um, so again it's relatively straightforward to configure um, I was just going to take you through that uh, so this is the to get to bookings um, first of all if you in go to office.com and you log in and down the left hand side or if you click on the waffle you can go and find all the apps that you've got and you can click on bookings uh, there so this is what it'll then take you to this window here so i've done another demo one before and i've done the breakwater one there which i can't access because i'm on my demo user and it's created by my normal user so you can't go and access other people's bookings pages unless you're, you've been given access to them so i'm going to create a booking calendar i'm going to Let's choose lawns, um, lawn care, lawn services. There we go, it's a default one. And I'll click on continue. And this gives us the ability, it'll just set up in the background um, and allow me to set up a bookings site for him. So there we go, this is my Stu's lawns. So if I go to um, business information, first of all, I can populate a bit more information in here. So I could put in I think it will allow me to go to pick up my office so I can pick up there I could put in the phone number um, send customer replies to me uh, you can have a website URL your terms and conditions anything like that you can just change the currency you want to work in uh, if I can find that Obviously, just above there, there we go. Um, you can set your business hours. So if you don't want to, if you're only gonna work afternoons, you'll set your business hours to be say, uh, midday till 5 p.m. Um, and that just gives you a template to be used across the board. You can also set specific hours for different staff members as well. So if someone's working a late shift or an early shift, they can have different hours personalized to them. You're gonna wanna set, set up a logo. So if I pop a new logo onto here, I created Stuart in Paint. I am a whiz in Paint. There we go. Stuart now has a logo. Um, should probably pay someone to do that kind of stuff for you and not have me do it. Um, so I've done the logo, set the time. I'm just going to add some stuff. So I need to save that first of all. That's just going to save that. Right. So stuff, there's only me in there because I've set it up. 
uh, Stuart's probably going to want to be involved in this. So if I click on add staff, um, I'm going to call it Stuart Moll, and I can add my staff members. So I just type and it'll search for people within your organization. Um, I obviously want to find Demo Stuart. Typical. There he is. Um, it will automatically pick a color, but I can give Stuart a different color. Obviously, some kind of green would be good. I can put his phone number on there for if he's got a different number. So he's going to be our service test number for now. Um, and this is where I can make him administrator or a guest. I should probably make him an administrator considering he's going to be managing this. Um, at the bottom is just email notifications. It'll just tell him when someone's booked in with him. Uh, so this is where you just set the availability. Um, so it'll look at his existing Outlook calendar and that will affect that. Let's say if he's already busy, that will then not make it, it will mean that it won't show in here. So you'll see that it will be grayed out for, you know, if he's not available, there's just no availability. So that will show like that. Um, and you can set it to use business hours, but this is also where you can override Stuart. So Stuart doesn't get up until about 10 o'clock on a Monday. So you can't book him until then. There we go. That's a lie, by the way. He's always up early. Um, so we need to add a service. So this is where you can have what kind of service you want to be able to book. So, and you can change the duration. Uh, you can set a price for it if you want to online. So if I click on this, initially it's set to initial consult consultation. Um, you can change that. You can add another one. So if we just add another service, uh, I'm not sure how long it would take, but uh, a couple of hours maybe just to check it over. Um, if you, you know, if this wasn't a lawn care business and you want, you wanted the meeting to be an online teams meeting, you tick this box, you tick this box here. That will then send both of you a teams link for you to join in at the time. You can just click from your calendar. You can put a bit of a buffer in on the service. So, if you've already got something in place, you can say, right, I, I want to make sure I've got half an hour or an hour before that other meeting. So I'm just going to say, okay, I don't want anything. That I'm going to put an hour buffer in. So it just gives them a bit more time. And then, and then afterwards, so it's just like half an hour just to get between meetings. Um, you can allow customers to manage it and cancel and things like that. You can put a price in if you want, um, fixed price. It's not cheap, 100 pounds. Um, and then I can save that. So that's Stuart's location service set up there. Um, to assign staff member, I need to go back. I should have done this when I was in there, sorry. Um, on the right-hand side here, assign staff, it lists all the staff that you've already created over here. And now I just want to assign Stuart. So I just do that. Stuart is ticked and I save. So that will be assigned to him there. I then need to do the booking page. So this is where... You can do a bit of customization. You know, you could force someone to have a Microsoft account if you wanted to, which seems a bit silly if you're doing lawn care. Um, if you don't want your page to be indexed, so if you've got a link on your website to it, you can stop Google from indexing it. Um, some other bits and bobs, you can set a theme. I think you should have some kind of green. Yeah, I think you'd like that one. Um, you can then set when customers can book services at the time increments. So you could have it start on five minutes, 10 minutes, 15, 20. Um, I think we've done ours internally every half an hour. So you can't book at 5.25. You could only book at 5 or 5.30. Um, lead times, if you want to book 365 days in advance, um, or you can say someone can't book within the next 24 hours. Uh, you can have people notified. Um, you can have them send a, an invite to so they can pop it into their calendar as well if you've got multiple staff like we do on our bookings page this is where uh it brings this box up here so people can you can go through and you can choose which staff member you want to to put onto the system i think we've also set ours so you can only book seven days in advance as well so anything part four to seven days you can't book uh, where's my list there we go so once i've done most of my general availability uh, okay, that's good. If I save and publish this, I go to the top, I can then get a link. So I can just copy that or I can click on open publish page. 
and there you go. There's Stuart's lawn consultation. So you can say, God, he's busy, isn't he? Can't even find a time slot. Hmm. I think I might have messed something up there. Um, either that or Stuart is really busy. So, but yeah, that, that's the general gist of that. Um, any questions? There is one question, but it's just flicking back to the power app. Um, okay. When using, this is from Luke again, so it's a good question. When using power apps, if you don't have internet, mm -hmm. does the submission hold until you are connected to the data? So can you use it offline and then it'll go and ping it all up there after you get the internet? Or? I don't believe it does it by default. Um, I think you need to do some customization to make it store it locally to then upload. We did a power app for someone in January uh, and we had to do a similar thing because they were going into warehouses where sometimes, you know, big warehouses where sometimes signal would be sketchy. And we had to do some customization to hold it locally to then do a sync further down the line, but, you know, when it came back into service, um, which could have been, you know, five minutes time, could have been a couple of hours time, could have been the evening. So yeah, there is a bit of customization that can be done. Great. Just like say thanks. thanks, John. That's really going to help my lawn care business <laughs> get off the ground. Do you, so I can sell this to you if you like. Um, good. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad it's been helpful. Uh, any other questions at all? No. Okay. All right. Well, we'd scheduled to take a break. We're a few minutes early. Um, so if we just have a, a ten minute break and start again at 9.55, just to allow people to, uh, you know, uh, get a drink. Um, and then after the break, uh, Jordan is going to talk about Power Apps um, and explain a lot better than I just did. Uh, Jack's going to talk about security, which is weird because I'm not talking about security. He's talking about data loss prevention and information rights management. And then after then, Jamie from the Air Ambulance is going to talk about Teams as a phone system and calling. Um, again, if anyone has things or any more questions in the next few minutes, um, give us a shout. If not, we'll see you at 9.55. Thank you very much. Hello again, everyone. I hope you're all back and have a nice cup of tea. I do. Um, oh, I said I'm again. Very sorry. Okay, so second half. Um, I'm not really 100% sure on timings, but so next uh, oh during the break i heard some worrying news i think our technical director is actually going to buy a van and start this business i'm slightly concerned by that please don't Stuart. um anyway so next up we have jordan who is going to tell, tell us all about power apps and give us some demonstrations so i'll uh, over to you jordan Thanks, John. Okay, so as John explained, I'm going to go through Power Apps, what it is, um, some of the Power Apps that Gintas, our SharePoint developer, has built for our clients and for us. Um, so some of you might be aware of Power Apps, some of you might not be, some of you might be using some. Um, so yeah, hopefully I can give you a bit more information on what they are and what you can do with it. So Power Apps is an inbuilt micro Microsoft 365 feature that allows people to create applications within their own environment. They can be used in a variety of ways on various devices. So you can use them on laptops, mobile phones, tablets. Um, John's showing you a little bit of that already. Um, Power apps can be added to your Teams application, either within a team itself or along the app bar on the left hand side. So I'll just show you those different ways in a moment. So let me, I've got a few to show you. So I just want to want to show you the range of what can be done with them. So hopefully this will give you some ideas for your own business. Let me just share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can all see the app that I have opened here. So this is um, an app that we were using before lockdown, but had been using it in a slightly different way since lockdown. So we used to use this check-in app. To, we had a tablet at our front door and we used it for any visitors coming into the building so they could pop their um, name, time, date in um, and their car bridge, I think we captured at the time. It was just kind of to show what, what you can do with this app. However, since 
um, COVID and seeing as we don't really get many visitors anymore, uh, we use it mainly for our staff check-ins. So this is to show when staff are coming physically into the office. So if I just show you how it works, these are obviously all the staff that we have in the building at the moment. If I just sign myself out and then sign myself back in again, uh, it just pops up with a little checklist here. So this is just to enable us to understand that everybody has washed their hands. Everyone's checked their temperature. So we've got a little thermometer at our front door so we can check that. And do we have any COVID symptoms? So as long as they're all ticked, it then enables you to sign in. If you don't tick them all, you can't sign in. You have to go home. So that's that. It tells you at the bottom here how many employees are in the office at any one time. And then all of this information, there's an audit trail stored in the background in SharePoint. So the same with any app that I show you today, everything is stored in the background. So if at any point you want to go and see who is in a particular day, when they checked in, when they checked out, that's all there, that's all available for you. So that's pretty much it um, for that app. Um, so the next one I wanna show you that Gintas has actually developed since lockdown. It's kind of in the same vein as well. So it's um, regarding staff coming into the office space. So this is our desk booking app. So, just to run through how this works with you. So we've got a floor plan. This uh, replicates our downstairs office here. And we've got an upstairs office as well. So all of this is customizable, um, depending on your floor plan. Um, we can make it look pretty or not, um, just completely how you want it really. Weeks go along the top here. So you can flick through the weeks to see who's got desks booked. And you can also block out desks. So for example, we have some staff members that sit in the engineering office. They are here all the time. So we've permanently blocked out those desks. And we've also permanently blocked out um, every other desk just to adhere to social distancing guidelines. Um, but all, again, this can all be changed as and when we need it, we can sort this around if we need to. So to book a desk, let's just flick to next week and say I want to sit in the downstairs office. So I want to book this desk on Monday the 26th. Uh, this is my demo account, so it's Demo Jordan. So that just pops in there that my initials. Um, it also means once I've clicked a desk there, so I've booked desk 21, I can't then set book desk 19 or best desk 25 on that same day. So I can only book the one desk, which just limits people booking multiple desks by accident. Equally, I can't unbook someone from their desk. So this is Ian, this is Dave Parler. I can't unbook them. I can only unbook myself. So if I just click myself again, it just removes me from that. So yeah, very straightforward. Um, it's really helped us manage who's coming in and out of the office at any one time, just to ensure that we're not crowding in here. And then Gintas has also added an admin feature here. So this is where we can set permanent bookings. So if I just show you this. So at the moment, um, these are the people that are assigned to a desk permanently. So if I want to add a new Person, let me just see which one is free. So if we go desk six, I will assign that to Gintas. And then you can see here that he's permanently booked that desk. So if I go back. And I just refresh this. And I go to the upstairs. 
you will see a picture of Gintas on that desk. So that just means now he's permanently booked on that desk and nobody else can book it. And then one of the other admin functionalities here that um, he's built in for us is just to track when people have booked desks and what desks they've booked and things like that. So just an audit trail really there if we ever need it. So yeah, that's pretty much the two sort of office related apps we've got there. So I now just want to show you one of the um, check-in apps that Gintas has built for one of our clients. So they, um, the company run Kelling Heath and Woodhill Holiday Parks. So it's kind of like our check-in app, but a little more complex. So it looks like this. So it's built in a kind of tablet slash phone format. So that's purely down to the fact that they use tablets for this. Um, being on site on the holiday park, it's kind of easier for them to walk around and move around. So uh, yeah, it's called the Park Movement Tracker. They have two sites, as I mentioned, so Kelling Heath and Woodhill Park. And it's to track any owners and guests coming in staff, contractors, deliveries, and then any sort of day visitors that are coming in and out of the park. Um, at the bottom here, it shows how many total people are on the site and how many units are occupied at any one time. So just to demonstrate how this works for someone as a, a, an owner of a um, holiday home, if I was coming into the park, I can click on this plus button here and I can type in my details. So that's obviously my real number. Um, are you the registered owner? Yes. Uh, what plot or pitch number are you? So I can pop in here. Mark at Kelling Heath has very kindly allowed me to use this live. So hopefully I don't mess anything up. Um, and then I can enter how many guests I have with me. So I have two people with me. And is anyone in your household showing COVID-19 symptoms? Yes or no? Um, I'm obviously assuming if it was a yes, you wouldn't be checking in. And then you can see here, it automatically captures the date and time that you are completing this form. So you don't have to fill any of that in. And then I click save. So then you can see the number of guests has come, gone up and the total people in sight has gone up. Um, the same with, for example, if we were to go to site for a meeting with Mark, we can pop in here in the contractors and we can select where we are visiting from. So all of this is to demonstrate that you can populate all of this information in the background. So this is pre-populated. This is something that a few members of their team have access to amend and update and you can have it pre-populate some information here. So, um, so we can tell everyone's got your number now. <laughs> um, and if I was gonna go with Gintas as well, I can just pop that in there. And again, um, it just captures the date and time of arrival. So yeah, I won't save that for now just because we're not going, but if I just show you how it, we would check out as well. So I checked in as an owner here. So if I just go in here, I can click the minus and I can just filter by my name. And I click onto my name and it tells me how long I've spent on site. Obviously, I have no time at all. Um, and yeah, it captures the, all the data in the background. So pretty straightforward but has really worked for them they have a lot of people as you can see they have a lot of people in and out of site they have multiple contractors on site pretty much every day every time I've looked at this there's been a few so um yeah they've got a lot of movement going on on that park um and then just to show you I can't show you the real report but they've linked this app into Power BI which means they can report on it at any time so this is how it would look. Obviously, I've bled out the, or I haven't been tested, bled out the guest names and phone numbers and stuff, so we can't see that. But just to give you an idea, um, the reason they have this obviously is that if anybody was on site and showed any symptoms of COVID-19, 
um, they could go back, they have a full audit trail of everyone that was on site at that one time. They can filter by these dates here and then have a full list of everyone's names, contact numbers, addresses, so that they can be contacted in that event. So yeah, any Power App can be linked into Power AI pretty much. So anything you want to report on that is a function. Okay, so a couple more that I just want to show you that we built for clients. So clients have come to us with some discussions around their internal processes and some things that, have, that take up quite a bit of time or things that they use paper for and don't want to use paper anymore. Um, so we've had discussions around those sorts of processes and built power up based on that. So the next one I wanna show you is an invoice approvals app. So this was built for a client, New Anglia. Um, and I think we've since built it for someone else as well. And it's a different way of storing a power app. So you'll see here, we've got a team. So whereas some of these apps are, are pinned to the side taskbar, um, you can actually have them within a team. So we've got the invoicing demo team and you can see two channels under here. Um, one of them you'll see is a private channel so that just means that limited people within that team have access to that channel. So that is the administration. So that's where people are uploading invoices and things like that. So I will just show you how this would work. Equally, you can have this pinned to the side um, and it can just be set up in a slightly different way. But if I just show you how this would work. So this is to in, a, in order to cut down the time that they spend passing around an invoice, having people sign it. Um, sometimes those sorts of paper processes can just be quite time consuming. So yeah, so this is a upload invoice form. So you can attach a, an invoice there. Um, the date received, so that can be today, that's fine. Um, zero invoice number, so you can have that populated to whichever accounting system you use as well. Obviously everything is customizable on this. Um, and the invoice date and invoice number. Supplier, so we've got some uh, real life suppliers here. Micro Sift is obviously one of them. Um, so, and then the net amount, you can set a VAT rate here or work out the VAT and add the total at the end. And then you can have, you can list how many approvers you require. So you can have up to three, but for the purposes of this, I'll just add um, John as the first and only approver. So, once I click submit on that, John will get a notification to say uh, that he's got a invoice that needs approving. Um, that can be configured, configured in any way you wish. So it can be an email, it can be a notification. So you can have in Teams, you can have a notification come up here or how we've set it up is that a flow will send you a Teams message. Um, and here you can see one I had earlier. So you have a new invoice to review, go to the invoicing team and approvals tab. So it's just, you can have that set up in any way you wish. So if I was going to go to approve an invoice, um, you come into the general team. So everyone would have access to this or everyone you want would have access to this. Invoice approvals. Oh, look, we've got a Stuart's Green Fingers Long Hair. Have you changed his name? Um, so here's a invoice I need to approve. I think I can view. No, I can't view. Um, I don't know why. I might just not be working on that. Um, Okay, but I um, can see the amount of the invoice number 
Um, I'm pretty sure you can normally open that, so I'll just check the GitHub of it. Um, and then I can add any comments that I want, um, and I can approve or reject, but in this case, I'll approve that. Um, and then I can go through all the invoices there. So just some of the, you'll see then, if you come back into the administration team, there's an invoices list um, and it will list all the invoices that we process, the net amount, the approvers, and any comments that they've had. Um, yeah, and then we can upload into our accounting system or however you want, really. Um, there's a suppliers list here. That's another sort of admin function. So you can add and remove suppliers into this. You can add other information if you want. Going back to the way John created a list earlier. Um, that's the sort of thing you can do with that. So hopefully that makes some sense. There's a quick question on this one, Jordan. Okay. Um, it's from an anonymous attendee. So, mm. hi, Jordan. Can you upload the invoice details from zero directly without re-keying? I think that was probably related to when you were keying in the, the zero invoice number. Okay, um, I don't really actually know the answer to that one. I don't know if it's a, it won't be an automatic, like you mean pull it straight from the invoice? I think so, yeah. Yeah, um, it's not, I don't think it's going to do that. Uh, it's not, it's not really intelligent enough to do that to read a PDF or Word document. Um, no, not no, intelligent no. enough to do that, although do that, some of the Microsoft AI, AI might be able to do it in the future. There are some API integrations to zero that you could potentially use that would allow you to, once you approve it, to automatically push it to zero. Um, yeah, we'd need to look at that on a case by case basis, I think, because it could be a bit of custom work. Uh, but yeah, if you want to talk to us about it, give us a shout. Great, Jordan, there's one other question, but I think it's going back to the check in app. Um, okay. is, is there a way to build into the app? Uh, when someone walks in and out of the building. So if, say they've got a company phone or something, you could have it done on location. Go yes. On. The answer is, yeah, I think you can. Um, you'd be able to see geo location too. Um, I think you could. You, yeah. I, I we haven't need... done it because we want people to say whether they've done three things. Um, we don't want people to just automatically say, oh yeah, oh, they're, they're in the building. We have, we've done it because they have to answer those three questions to make sure that they don't have any COVID symptoms. The, the other way you could do it is have like an NFC tag on the wall as you go in. Yeah. So you would tap your phone on the wall, pick up the NFC signal, and next to that, it would say, I have washed my hands and everything like that. That would be the other way you could do it. But yeah, like you say, Jack, this is a good way of making sure people have, have stated that they clearly wash their hands and check their temperature. That's it so far. Any more questions? Cool, okay. Um, I have just got uh, one last um, app that I would like to show, if that's okay. Um, so this is something that we actually built for the Air Ambulance. So Jamie is gonna be talking in a few moments. Um, we built it for them. Um, I know that they have um, quite a lot of team, different teams and different um, training courses that they send people on so it was really useful for them um, and it's something that historically we we don't track who um, completes what training internally we haven't done previously and that's something that we want to track going forward so this is effectively our skills matrix now so uh, we called it courses um, so these are all the courses that we have pre-populated into this app so far. So these are the kind of courses that our engineers will complete. We can put in webinars in here and exams and things like that. Um, so I'll just run you through that. We have it on a year by year basis so that we can kind of encourage people to complete new training courses every year. So everyone will have access to this app that we've pinned to our taskbar here. I keep calling it a taskbar, so it's app bar, sorry. Um, and they'll have access to view all these. So, and then also to view the matrix. If I just show you both of these first. So our matrix will look something like this. And it comes up. 
Um, so you'll see all of our employees are listed on the left hand side here and then all of the courses and exams are listed across the top here. And when someone says, OK, I've done that course, um, it populates it into this skills matrix. Obviously, we are just starting to use this at the moment, so it's not very heavily used. But if I just show you, for example, so an engineer or um, any one of our team can come into here, they can go into my courses and they can select one of the courses that has been pre-populated in here. So, for example, I completed this course last week. Um, so I can click that, I can put the date completed and I can click submit. So on my home page here for me, I can see all the ones I've completed so far, obviously not a lot. Um, and then in the matrix, everyone will be able to see that I've completed those courses. Um, and I can see everything that everybody else has completed as well. I don't know, I'll keep trying to load this, obviously it's not going very fast. Um, there you go. So it's across there. If there's a course that somebody has completed but isn't um, pre-populated in the My Courses tab, they can come into here and suggest a course. So I'm going to add that form to share. So Teams. Um, and long hair. I probably shouldn't put that because it's actually real. Um, and then we've put down here the year that we populates to this year and course points every hour acquires 10 points. So we, that's how we work out how many points people get. This is just something we're trialing. So we're going to have an internal point system um, just to ensure that everybody is completing a minimum amount of training per year. So every hour is 10 points, so this will be 20 points, and then I can click Submit. So that will then go to, oh, we've got a nice, nice little GIF. I forgot about that. Um, <laughs> I get a flow here. Um, so if I just pop into my chat, I've been sent a flow that says you've got a new course suggested. Um, so it's just something for me to review. So that's great. I'll go back into the Courses app. And then I can go into this course list here. So the course list and the staff list are admin lists. So they're kind of hidden to most employees here. Um, and then I can scroll down, I can see all the ones that have been approved and I can see, okay, this is a new one, it's a suggestion. So I just need to approve or reject that, but I'm going to approve now, obviously, because I did it. So the way we're going to do that is edit in grid view. I can scroll down and I can change it from a suggestion to approved. And I think I just have to exit grid view to save it. So then that will pop into the my courses tab. I'm lucky. Um, there you go. So platform to share. So that's then there for anybody that has watched this webinar internally, and um, they can add that to their skills matrix. So, yeah, you can do th this. Is all again um, very customizable. It's it's quite a good one that you can kind of manage internally yourselves as well. So you wouldn't need to come to us every five minutes every time you want to add something. Um, and yeah, it's just a good way of tracking what we're doing internally. Um, so, is there any questions on that one? There, there are. So, uh, Teresa Woods um, has asked, can the courses app set reminders, i.e. if you've got like a first aid course and you have to refresh it every so many years, can we set like a date, an expiry date, I guess, and then have a yes. reminder come up in the background? Yeah, exactly. I think that's something that we're actually planning on doing anyway internally is that we're having an, a 12-month expiry um, on... Uh, training courses that people have completed so yeah we can have reminders set up when that expires I think that's what the ambulance do as well because they have a lot of medical training so by law they have to complete it um within a certain amount of time yeah um there's one other question um mm -hmm. 
which is from Joe Bygrave. And it mm -hmm. is, hi, Jordan. I see you have an expenses and a holidays app. Um, can you release like a link for people to input details for them without them needing to have a Microsoft account? Um, you do need a Microsoft account to access um, Power Apps, unfortunately. So, yeah. yeah. Um, just, to, just to expand on that, you can get frontline worker 365 accounts, which have them built in. They're not as expensive as a standard 365 account, and it includes things like bookings and shifts, uh, and you can do power apps for them as well. So that's another way of uh, managing that. Okay, it is, it is cost for that person, but you can bring them all into the holidays and expenses and have everything built for them. Thanks, John. Um, Cool. So I think I've covered all the power apps I wanted to show you. Um, but as I mentioned at the start, there's a lot that you can do with power apps. It's not just limited to the things I have shown you. So hopefully you can have a think about some of the processes that you have internally. And hopefully some of these ideas will help you streamline those a little. Uh, also, remember, it doesn't just need to be administrative processes. Um, so as John just mentioned, you can get first line worker licenses. So that's for people that are out in the field, so people um, not assigned to an office particularly. So I know that we have talked to some of our clients about um, maintenance apps, so on-site maintenance apps, including photos, things like that, audits um, and trackers, for example. So yeah, hopefully I've covered everything, but if there's anything else, is there another question? There's one more question which mm -hmm. is what license do I need for Power Apps? Uh, so I think you mentioned that earlier, didn't you, John? So uh, Business Basic, Business Standard, Premium, E35, um, Frontline Worker, obviously. Um, I think it's covered in most license types. So yeah, hopefully that helps. Cool. Um, OK. So I think I'm passing over to Jamie. No, Jack. Sorry, Jack. Oh, God. Data loss prevention. Don't miss, don't miss oh, the exciting subject of sorry. data loss prevention. <laughs> OK, go for it, Jack. I'll but everyone's been waiting for this bit. OK. Right, I'm just going to share my screen. I'm going to show a video in a bit, so I need to make sure I'm sharing my computer sound, which I am. So data loss prevention and a bit about information rights management as well. Um, it's not the most exciting subject, but I think it is a really important one. Um, it's data loss prevention is basically designed to help stop sensitive data leaking from your company. Um, a good example of it is anything with a credit card number in it. If you're a company which regularly takes people's credit card numbers and records them somewhere, you probably don't want that information leaving your company and going into the wrong hands. Um, so first of all, as a company, you need to sort of identify the types of data that are important to you and that need to be protected. Um, and then there's a whole host of ways of protecting them. Um, Microsoft have built it into most, nearly all of their products now. So it works within Exchange Online, so your emails, it works in SharePoint, it works in Teams, and it works in OneDrive. Um, it's really important to sort of educate your users around data loss prevention policies and make sure that people remain compliant within your business, but also make sure that you're not blocking the type of work they do, because it might be you're a financial company that does need to share that type of information with other it, third parties and stuff. So you don't want to, you don't want someone's day to day job being stopped by these policies that you put in place. So you can build workflows around that. And I'll show you that in a demo later on. Um, a couple of just good examples are you can set labels within documents. So say you've got a really sensitive project called Alpine House, for instance, um, you can set tags against a whole load of um, documents. And you can even get um, SharePoint, if you're st storing your documents in SharePoint, you can do a search for any documents with keywords in it. So you could search for the words Alpine House and you could then set tags against those documents and set a policy that just says these documents cannot leave our organization. So if someone tried to email it out, they'd just get blocked. 
someone tried to share it in OneDrive or a SharePoint site or through a Teams chat to an external person, it would just say no. Um, and again, I'll show you a little demo of that in a little while. Um, another good one is, um, say you've got a set of set, look, look, set a senior executive team um, and you want to make sure that they don't accidentally delete a load of emails that were really important. So you can set like retention policies against a subset of users. So you could create a group called executive leadership team. You could pop all of your executive leaders into that group and then you can set against their mailbox, against OneDrive, against any anywhere they store their data, you can say, look, I, I never want them to be able to delete something. They'll be able to delete it from Outlook, but it actually in the background is still retained. So you still have that. Um, so that's just, that's just a few of the ways that you can do it. Um, but enough of, of me talking about it. I'm going to share a, a video from Microsoft because they explain it far better than I can. Today, your data can often be one of your most critical assets. But how can we always know whether a piece of data is confidential and whether someone is emailing something against company policies, even by accident? You can keep your data safe with a feature in Exchange called Data Loss Prevention, or DLP. It is a unique policy management system designed to help keep your critical information in-house and out of the wrong hands. Users will be alerted to sensitive information alongside their everyday email experience through policy tips on Outlook Client or Outlook Web App. It gives admins the power to analyze, protect, and report on sensitive data traveling inside and outside of your organization. Keep your business safe by scanning from individual clients and the server. And all of this from the easy to use Exchange Admin Center. Not just a simple text scan, DLP does deep content analysis to ensure that no matter what you want to keep safe, from credit cards to account numbers, it is protected at the level you want. DLP goes further with document fingerprinting. For example, you could take a common document, such as a patent template, and create a unique fingerprint. Then, if a user sends a patent, Exchange would match it with the document fingerprint and deal with it based on a variety of customized options. From blocking outright, providing a policy tip, encrypting the email, or just notifying the admin or compliance officer in the back end. You can start taking advantage of DLP in one of three ways. First, you can easily select from one of the many policy templates that we provide and are always working to build upon. Second, you could select a template from the partner ecosystem. Companies all around the world are adding new and customized policy templates across a growing number of industries. Finally, you could create a policy from scratch or an update from an existing template, fine tuning for your specific needs. DLP also helps you track success by offering built-in reporting you can track policy usage during testing and also once you've enforced the policy to determine the impact and success. Even providing real-time updates through incident reports that can be sent at each individual occurrence. Data loss prevention is a big part of Microsoft's commitment to Office 365 security and compliance capabilities. Okay, so I'm going to flick over and do a quick demo of all of this for you, for what I've set up. So <clears throat> I've just quickly applied uh, a policy, which is the UK financial data policy. Um, so Microsoft have a whole load of built-in templates. Um, I think they've got a GDPR one for personally identifiable information, which is probably quite an important one for people. Um, but yeah, I've just done it on, on UK financial data. So if I try to send an email out, can type my own name. So I'm going to send this outside of the organization. I'm doing this in a test tenant. So that is going external. I'm just going to send myself and Stuart my credit card information. Jack, does it have to be in dark mode? It does, yeah. Data loss prevention doesn't work in light mode. So okay. no, it, can, it can be in light mode or dark mode. I just prefer it on my eyes. <laughs> um, so I've, I've, I've written a credit card information in there. I've said, please don't spend it all. I'm one of those people that don't bother reading these tips at the top and I just hit send. Um, but then it will pop up and say, hold on, 
your organization won't allow you to send this message, um, please remove it and try to send the message again. So I've now been stopped from doing it. What if I actually should be sending that information to Stuart though? He really needs some money to get his lawn care business going. So I'm gonna come in here and say, actually, this is legitimate. I need to override it. Stuart needs to buy a new lawnmower. I'm gonna override and I'm gonna hit send. And that will now send. Um, it also sends the administrator, which is me, um, an email saying someone in your organization has sent uh, an email which matched the data loss prevention policy I've put in place. Um, and it will say the override reason as to what, why they've done it. Um, now, all of these templates and, and policies are all customizable. So you could just say, if, if you should never ever be sending this type of information out, you can just do a flat block and say, no, I'm not letting it, letting this information leave my organization. Or you can do overrides. Um, you could also do things where actually, if I am going to send that information, perhaps it should be encrypted. So it can automatically encrypt the message and send it. Um, so there's a whole load of customizable features in there. But I've, for the purpose of this demo, I've kept it fairly simple. Um, so like I said, it applies to different areas of Office 365, and it will also happen in Teams. So I did do this earlier, but I'll just paste the same credit card info and send it to Stuart. Oh, it's blocked me again. So it blocks it really quick. Stuart will have got a pop-up saying he's got a message, but it will just say this message was blocked. Again, I can come in here and override it, or I can report it to my admin and say, actually, I should be able to send this information. That would then send it to the administrator for review and they can work out whether they need to tweak the policy to allow that sort of information to go. Um, so I talked briefly earlier about message encryption. Again, I've, there's the, the rule that comes over to the administrator. Um, so I thought I'd just show you a quick feature in Outlook now, which used to be a bit more tricky to set up and you had to have groups of people and if it was sent to certain people and rules, you can now just click encrypt on a message. So if I if I want to send some sensitive information, I only want it to go to a specific recipient outside of my organization. I've got a test Gmail account here. Don't want anyone else to find out that Stuart's starting a lawn care business. So I've encrypted the message and I've hit send. If I pop over to my Gmail over here, I've got an encrypted message. So there's a couple of ways that encrypted messages work. You can send them to people who have Office 365 themselves and have a Microsoft account, you can send them to Gmail or you can send them to pretty much any email. Um, and it just means that only that person can open the message. So if this message is forwarded, intercepted, or it gets into the wrong hands, if they were to click read the message, if they don't have either the Gmail identity, so if I click sign in with Google, I'd be able to sign in with my Gmail account, or I could hit sign in with a one-time password. And that will email a one-time passcode to this email address. So as long as my emails haven't been compromised, which of course I haven't because I've got MFA on and I've done my Mimecast security awareness training. I can come in here, or in here rather, pop in the one-time passcode, click continue. And now I've got that really important sensitive information that Stuart is starting a lawn care business. Um, so that's just a few of the little features in Office 365. I was going to talk to you about external access and sharing, um, but Microsoft's got a bit of a problem with it today and I can't seem to show you it. So I was going to show you, basically I've opened up Teams, which is another important thing when we're talking about sharing information externally and having this stuff in place. You can open up Office 365, you can restrict it to 
So you can only communicate certain domains or you can restrict it. So you can talk to everyone, but maybe you don't want to talk to one or two people, people like organizations. So you can, there's a lot of different ways you can restrict it. But unfortunately, I can't demo that to you because Microsoft's having a bit of a moment with it. Um, Jack? Yeah. Got a couple of questions if it's, that's okay with you. Yeah. Um, so Patrick Peel from the Air Ambulance has asked, uh, does DLP uh, screen attachments? So I think he means like Word, Excel, kind of PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah, it can. Um, so you can have attachments in, say, SharePoint, or if you were to attach uh, a Word document with credit card information in, um, it would see it would screen that block. It. And does it do that by default, or do you, do you have to switch it on? Is it uh, uh, there's a tick box in the policy, I believe. Yeah. Okay. It makes sense to always have that on, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, and Joe Bygrave from Blue Sky Leisure has said, um, has asked that what what on the email encryption, what about if someone has access to the account as a designated user, um, could they still open? So I, I think Joe has access to a couple of other mailboxes. Yeah. Could Joe go into David's mailbox and access that email? Um, technically, yes, with the one-time passcode option. Okay. That's very because true. Because they'd be able to go and get that code and then log in with it. Could you turn the one-time passcode option off? I suppose that would be challenging, wouldn't it? It would. It would probably. You could probably do it if if you're sending to another Microsoft account. I think that would work. But I think the point yeah. of the one-time passcode is so that it can because they they link with so Gmail. It would work as well because they accept that as an identity. But if you've yeah. got like a, your own email server or if you're just using one-on-one -on email or something, then it needs that one-time passcode to work. That's very true. I suppose it's just something to consider then, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, if you're receiving encrypted messages and making sure you trust whoever has, yeah. has access to your mailbox. Yeah, we do have one of our clients actually for their senior leadership team. They have secondary mailboxes, which are called confidential, that aren't shared. So they have day to day, they've maybe got some PAs or some other people who have access to their mailboxes. And then they have a separate one, which is like a confidential one. So if they want to send stuff confidentially that no one else can have access to, you could do it there. Yeah, which is just a way around it. Are they shared mailboxes, Jack, or are they licensed mailboxes? They're shared mailboxes. Okay. Excellent. Uh, that's all the questions for now, unless anyone's got any more. No? Right. No. Okay, I will stop sharing and then let you hand over to Jane. Thank you, Jack. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to Jamie for the, the final bit. His uh, webcam's nice and flickery. Uh, brand new Microsoft Live webcam. Obviously, don't buy one of them. Um, so, oh, hold on. I think there's just one more question popped up. Uh, what is the licensing you need for DLP? Um, DLP is included in Microsoft Business Premium. Um, if not, I think you have the, um, it's one of the other, I uh, um, can't remember the name. There's another license, which is about five pounds per person, isn't there? E yeah, and enterprise, enterprise mobility and security. Yeah. That's the one. So yeah, it, it's not included in the standard licensing, but it, but um, you can get it uh, by going onto one of them products. Right. Sorry, Jamie. Um, yeah. So Jamie has kindly volunteered, been bullied into talking about uh, their moving to Teams as a phone system. Because Jamie's really keen about IT and moving forward, he tends to be our guinea pig for a few things. So last year, um, Jamie volunteered to be a guinea pig. I did say no, um, but he wanted to do it uh, to move their phone system to be run in Microsoft Teams. So he's now going to hopefully tell us a bit more about it. So over to you, Jamie. Thank you, John. I uh, just want to check that everybody can see the just presentation there. Fab. So let me just pull up my notes. Um, so we moved to the Microsoft Brain system. Sorry, uh, we moved to the Microsoft Brain system around 12 months ago now. Your, your presentation's taken a second to load, Jamie, I think. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what's... Um, There you go. Uh, can you see that now? I can see that, yeah. 
perfect. <laughs> I'm not not quite sure what happened. Um, great, yeah. So we we moved to Microsoft Teams calling around about twelve months ago now. Um, our traditional phone system, which you know was, I'm sure many people are familiar with, that kind of phone sitting on the uh, sitting on the desk. Um, it was coming to the end of the life, and we we were being forced to essentially make a decision whether we wanted to sign into a new phone system um, with another supplier or whether we wanted to move to something like Microsoft Teams. So we had a few options to consider. Do we want to go for a phone system like um, like the one on the screen, um, which made it quite bulky to have um, to have such a handset on a on a workspace. It also made it quite difficult for hot desking. With hot desking, if you wanted to ensure that everybody had the same functionality regardless of where they sat, you would likely have to buy a physical handset for each um, for each desk, which becomes expensive. And it also gets difficult with home working. So some of the phone systems that we explored had an option for having sort of a physical handset and having a mobile app. Mobile apps are okay. Um, some of the ones that we looked at did have issues at the time and, you know, it's sort of a blessing in disguise as such because we found Microsoft Teams calling. Um, but the mobile apps restricted you to your mobile phone, whereas something like Microsoft Teams, you've actually got the, the phone system on the, on the PC, which was ideal for us because not all of our users have mobile phones. The benefit that we have from that is, you know, someone can pick up from the office and it was it was proved um, during March when everybody had the lockdowns is someone could just take a laptop or we could set someone up with a laptop who would typically have a fixed PC in the workspace and they could just go and work from home, log on, they would have their calling if they took their headset home and they would have all of the other functionality as well, which would worked quite hard to um, ensure that our systems are mobile. Another benefit with the Microsoft Teams calling platform is that the licensing is so simple. Um, I know when we initially onboarded with a project that there was the minutes and the calling license separate. And now Microsoft have introduced both the calling and the minutes into one package. So the, the benefit that you've got from that as well is with Microsoft projects, it will um, Microsoft licensing is that you're tied in for 12 months but for one license and please correct me if I'm wrong um, so we had the ability that if we wanted or if we decided that we didn't like the project uh, we didn't like the phone system we could use, you know the 30 40 licenses that had been issued and reduce that down to one and explore other systems so we we had the flexibility there and even for typical phone systems, you know, you're signed in for a lot longer than 12 months, you're signed in for two, three, four, five years, a lot of the time to offset, <coughs> sorry, offset the hardware costs. I'm sorry for the noise in the background. So the Microsoft Teams call, <laughs> the Microsoft Teams calling um, platform is great in the fact that it's universal across all of the devices that you use. So whether that be a mobile phone, a laptop, or one of the Teams integrated phones. The UI is very familiar. Anyone who's been introduced to one device can often quite pick up with any other device and get going with it. Um, it's also secure. And you have the ability to still configure the call queues, the auto attendance. Um, you have automatic transcription for voicemail messages. So for our main supporter engagement team, that was fantastic because if they come in in the morning and they've got 20 voicemails, they can quickly scan through the inbox and see the text of their emails, uh, of the voicemails, rather than having to go through, listen. And it, it really sort of speeds up that process. And you've also got the transcription feature available on um, the application itself and the mobile phone. So, sounds easy, right? Not quite. <laughs> Teams changes so frequently, it's so hard to keep up with, up to date with the updates and updating the training material internally. Microsoft bundles so many changes in with their product, products 
that quite often something that they promise when it's released, it, it's not quite how you imagined it. And uh, people's programs also update at slightly different times. So one person might uh, report from one week and then it will slowly progress as, uh, as people's clients are updated. Some features are lacking, so it doesn't feel as refined as essentially a full, a full blown phone system. However, it is always being updated and Microsoft are always releasing new features. Um, one thing that I would that I would say is I could just going back to the features that Microsoft often announce. I wouldn't personally wait for them. Um, if you're thinking about changing your phone system, get involved, get set up, um, wait for them, uh, wait for them features. When they're released, they might work. When they're released, they might not. Um, so you, you really have to decide the phone system as it is now, will it work for you? Will it benefit you in its current form? So was it right for us to jump at the time? Personally, I think it was it was fantastic and we couldn't have done it at a better time, especially um, with the pandemic. We, we didn't see this coming. We, we were making this change anyway, but the the ability it's given us to be able to work so flexibly wherever anyone is, um, you know, they can pick calls up on their phone. If they're out, they can pick calls up on their laptop. It also gives us the flexibility as well, is that if we have a uh, an internal project coming up, uh, for example, calling supporters with enough notice, we can onboard additional users for a month, maybe two months, however long the project's going to be. And we can then get rid of them licenses. It is work, um, so you do have to plan for that. And it's not ideal, but the, the, uh, the ability is there um, without having to issue everyone expensive hardware. The headsets, for example, that we purchased, we purchased ones of Amazon. Uh, I think it was between 25 and 30 pounds a headset. So that, that cost is dramatically reduced from what you'd be looking at with a traditional phone system having to buy the handsets. Great water, really great as well. Um, it was, as John mentioned, we were sort of the, the guinea pig for great water. And there, there were some lessons from both of us that we'll learn. And um, I think it's an understanding of when you're onboarding your project early, that it's not going to be perfect. And when looking at the documentation now and the research, you're, there's so much more in research and information online. If you are looking at Microsoft Teams calling, um, when we took on the project, there, there was nothing. Um, you sort of Google Microsoft Teams calling and no, nothing would come up. So a Microsoft documentation isn't always great. Um, would what we have, what would we have done differently? The, this is as great as the project was, um, and I think one of the key points we learned when rolling out Microsoft Teams calling is we we were, we were restricted by the amount of time that our old phone system provider was giving us um, to sort of move away from the platform and to make a decision. I think the amount of help guides now out. Uh, I think we would have benefited from having published more internal guidance and maybe spending a little bit more time with people to ensure that they're confident with the with the system itself yeah. it's also important to be aware of the changes and if, as soon as someone flags a change or something's not working it, it's quite often it's it is working but how microsoft has updated the product means that you might have to move a window out of the way to um, be able to see the transfer button for example I'm just flicking through my notes, but yeah, I, I think um, I think it's it's really great, um, and I hate to think of where we would have been if we still had a physical phone system, and trying to trying to manage calls coming in internally. I, I don't even know where we'd have gone about that, and the the cost saving as well. The cost saving for us was huge. So. Does anyone have any questions? There is a question. I'm not sure it's actually aimed at you. Um, the, the question is, does Teams have any integrations with third parties such as a CRM? Um, yes, depending on the software. And quite often the 
integration is with a th another third party. So it, you need to look at it on a case by case basis. There's nothing that will just say, yes, it will integrate with a CRM. There are other things you can do. Um, yeah, I think that's one thing Microsoft have got to get better at along with call recording. There's no call recording built into the Microsoft platform, um, which I know has put some people off. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Jamie. Um, you've kind of answered most of my questions, uh, really. If you could change, if you could do one thing differently, if you did it again, what would you do? Yeah, I think we, we would have, it's hard because it, the system develops so quickly um, and so many things are changed. I think having a better plan of exactly exactly what we wanted with the features available. Um, so understanding, you know, when someone calls our main 03450 number, having the introduction, having the call group and who that call group goes to, um, the, just the overall um, the overall plan, I think, could have been better. Um, and I think that really was, could have been improved by understanding more the features that the Microsoft phone system has. Yeah, um, I, I, I agree. I, I can things. show a quick demo as well. Yeah, if you want to, yeah. Sorry, I'll please. We've got a few minutes. So can you see that or not? Uh, yeah, I might have to reshare. I can see it. So, one, two, three, one, perfect. So, the phone system itself, um, you've got all your familiar tabs. So, you've got activity, chat, teams, calendar, calls. Uh, I believe you still have calls even without the phone system license. When you, so it's no drastic system change when you add the Microsoft Teams calling license. The main change is this little box right here that gives you your number voicemail and the ability to put in a number uh, that, that's the simplicity of it you, you know you're not having to train staff on a whole new different system if they're already familiar with Microsoft Teams you're just having to train you know put put in this number um, how to transfer calls and how to um, put people on hold for example so just for quick Um, you can also search with people with our Active Directory. We have everyone's mobile numbers linked to their profile. So as soon as you want to search for someone internally, we well, normally use a search function at the top, search that person. Um, and you, you know, you could either call them on Teams or call them on the brand line, whatever you prefer. You also have the ability to add contacts, pin groups, different groups, other contacts. So when you call, um, it will take you to screen such as this i don't think you'll be able to hear my audio um but it just simply calls through as the mo the landline number and you can ge geographically set them numbers as well when you buy them so you've got actions such as transfer consultant transfer and park call park call works quite well in uh, an office environment so if you've got someone on the other side of the room and you say can you pick up park call such number that person can do that without having to go through transferring processes or you can open it up to the room so for example we parked the call and it's got my name parts call code 10 and if someone wants to pick that up i'm going to show myself up now because i can't remember straight off the top of my head um and i'm trying not to show all my numbers and uh, parts calls here so in part call 10, pick up, and that then connects that call. You can also do that if you need to leave. So it, it is a well, really simple maybe. system. So you could you could park the call and then pick up the park call on your mobile and walk out of the office, can't you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, which works works really well. Um and the, the general response that we've had from staff internally as well is that it has been great. And there are not many things that people would change about the system once they get used to it. It's, it's expected with any sort of change and moving to an entirely new system from traditional handsets that people have been using for years. 
are not known any different to a Microsoft Teams or you know completely virtual phone system. Um, but on on the whole, people are being really positive about the change. Thank you, Jamie. Um, got a question from Paul. Uh, how do you find the call quality, uh, like dropouts, crackles, robot voice? Any issues that you you've really had there? Um, so certainly initially we had some uh, call quality issues, and I think that's probably with Microsoft and their new project on their new sort of systems trying to figure it out. Um, I know recently we've had we haven't had as many reports, or if any, as far as I can remember, with Microsoft Teams uh, call quality. There can be issues, and sometimes the issues are dependent on, especially if people are working from home, their Wi-Fi. So whether their OneDrive is uploading files, downloading files, that can have an impact on, um, on the call quality. But once you educate your users and you say, well, if you are experiencing poor call quality, just make sure to check your OneDrive and maybe pull syncing for a few hours um, or let it sync overnight when you're, when you're not using the machine if, if your internet's particularly poor. I've got a question. Do okay. you do any report? Do you do any reporting on your calls at all? We do. Um, so each month, quite often, our director for uh, engagement and income will ask how many calls have we had in, and with that, you can see, you know, um, the the drilling down aspect isn't fantastic within uh, the Microsoft Admin Center. However, you, you can pull that off as a Excel document and filter out the columns. So you, you get quite close and you can see how many calls you've taken and how long the calls have been. So you can work out roughly you know, the, the length of each call and how much time people are spending on the, on the phone. It's useful for us, especially when we have campaigns. So we can release campaigns or we release um, you know, a new magazine advert, TV advert, social media ad, and it allows us to see the trend of calls coming into the organization. Thank you very much. That, um, yeah, thanks so much for, for doing that. Um, no all right, problem. well, that brings us perfectly to 11 o'clock, the time we said we'd finished the meeting today. So thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for everyone for speaking to uh, Stuart, Jordan, Jack, and Jamie just now. Thank you, Sam, who sits in the background and organizes everything. Um, all the Zoom teaches me how to use Zoom because um, obviously it's not Microsoft. And yeah, thank you all for coming. I hope you have a really lovely day and um, we'll see you again next time. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. See ya. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.